Good morning everyone, uh, good to see you all here this morning on this Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent. And one of the things that we normally do at the beginning of Advent is our tradition to try uh, to help us to prepare for the birth of Christ is to light a, a candle each Sunday on the Advent wreath. So I'll just uh, come around the front here to where the Advent uh, wreath is, and we will say together some liturgy. Mayday, mayday, calling all Christians, it is time to wake up, for salvation is nearer than when we first believed. This is Advent, the season of great hope, the joy of the coming Christ be with you all. Oh, come on, it sounds as if you're asleep. Give yourself a rattle and wake up. So let's try that again. The joy of the coming Christ be with you all. And also with you. Oh, that's better. So today we light the candle of hope. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of hope. Together we say, our hope is in God and in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the one appointed by God to be judge of all things. He is the one through whom God has promised to save and redeem his people. We light this first uh, candle of hope today, and George is going to come and light the candle of hope for us this morning. And it is that one there, Georgia. So if you just come around and grab the matches and light that one for us, that will be wonderful. So we light this candle today to remind us that he is our hope and the hope of the world. We thank God for the promises he has made to us and for the light he has brought into the world. So let's say together, O oh God of hope, Emmanuel, God with us, we pray to you to send your light into our hearts. Help us to be ready for the day and the hour of Christ's appearing. Live in us and help us to live in you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, touch us, transform us, so that our worship, our celebration, our time of preparation, may be pleasing unto you, both now and forevermore. Amen. So we're going to uh, enter now our time of worship. And thank you, Georgia, for your wonderful lighting of the Advent candle. Let's all stand and begin with living hope.
Lord, we just thank you as we gather today, just reminding ourselves that you indeed are our living hope. So, Lord, our soul just wants to magnify you. We just rejoice.
you may be seated. Kate, who's our new singer here this morning? Kate, who's our new singer here this morning? Winnie. 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 Hello, Winnie. Good to have you up the front with us. Great. Okay, kids, you're all in place, all down the front. Now, she's had about four or five Sundays off from doing kids' talks. So she might be a little bit rusty this morning. So here's the rusty one. Come to uh, share the kids' talk with you. Is that working? It's on. I've even got my notes with me this morning just in case I forget because sometimes I do because I'm a bit rusty, apparently. Thank you for that introduction, Steve. Well, that's what you said in the car this morning. No, that's what you said in the car this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what time of the year this is in the church? You know what it's called? Okay. Advent. Yes, Advent. Advent. So in Advent, what we're doing is we're preparing for Christmas. But we're not preparing for Christmas by shopping or by cooking or by buying presents or by wrapping presents, but rather we're preparing for the real reason for Christmas, which of course is the coming of who? Who? Coming of who? Jesus. That's right. That's right. Okay. And as part of our Advent... Georgia lit a candle this morning. Now there are, before we get to the white candle, there are four purple candles and each of those candles represents a marvellous gift given to us through Jesus Christ. And the first one is, can you remember what it was called this morning? Did you hear it? Hope. So the first one is hope. So Georgia, what do you hope for? Maybe thinking about Christmas or school or... Graduation. I, I have a hope for, for the end of COVID. Oh my goodness. Who else is hoping for the end of COVID? Oh yes, we are all hoping for the end of COVID. Okay. So we've got our hopes. We hope that our football team will win. Yeah, and they did. Yep. We hope our football team will win. We hope it's going to be fine tomorrow when we want to go and do something special. All those sorts of hopes. But you know, there's another type of hope, and it's a bit harder to understand. So I was sort of thinking about it this morning, and I've come up with another word for it, and I think it's about depending on something to happen. So if you put, if you put all your hopes on something, you're depending on it, aren't you? So if you put all your hopes on that one friend at school, and then that school leaves, that, that, friend leaves, you're disappointed, aren't you? If you put all your hopes on one particular present for Christmas and you don't get it, then you're disappointed, aren't you? And it could spoil Christmas. There's lots of people who have put all their hopes on things like their businesses, their jobs, their travel plans, and COVID has stopped it. So there's lots of people that are feeling really disappointed with their lives at the moment because of that. But do you know, do you know that you can depend on Jesus? You can put all your hopes on Jesus and you will never be disappointed by him. Okay, so that's quite a different kind of hope, isn't it? I've got a balloon here that I think shows the difference about 
that hope. I'm not going to burst it, I promise. All right. All right. So if I'm going to blow this balloon up with all my plans and my hopes, let's go, okay, this is a plan or a hope for a promotion. This is a plan or a hope for graduation. This is a plan for a really good grade in my test. This is my hope for going out with a really good friend tomorrow. All right, so blow it up, put a knot in it. Oh, let's see what's going to happen with this now. So I've got a balloon. Okay, now to keep that balloon floating, I have to work at it, don't I? Okay, what happens if I let this balloon go? It's not going to float, is it? It's going to fall. Ben, you're exactly right. If I filled that balloon with helium, what would happen to it? It would float. It would fly. That's right. And that's just the same. If we fill our lives with our own plans and our own hopes, it'll sink. But if we fill our lives with the hope of Jesus, it will fly and it will float. I want to share with you a fantastic thing that's in the Bible, and I think I've read it to you before. It's from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, and it says, this is from God, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to give you a hope and a future. So no matter what happens to your plans, no matter what happens to your hopes, you've got Jesus in your life, and that is the greatest plan and the greatest hope that you can have. So let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you that you came into our lives, that you came into the world at that very first Christmas, and that you are our hope and you never let us down. Amen. Hey, I don't think you are very rusty at all. Okay, let's stand and share the peace. So the Lord be with you. We are the body of Christ, and the peace of the Lord be always with you. So let's share the peace with each other as we wave the kids off to Kids Club. I assume there's Kids Club, even though Janet's not here. Kelly's doing Kids Club. Good on you, Kelly. We'll get the Daniel Award. Well, we can't do that anymore. Here, Ben. I'll give you an elbow. There you go, mate. Okay. Rightio, if you'd like to be seated, Heather's going to come forward and read the gospel reading for us today. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 37. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. 
What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we come before you to ask you indeed to prepare our hearts, prepare our lives for the celebration of Christmas once again, and also the hope of your return, Lord, that the good news of your return will bless our lives and help us on our way as we seek to live for you. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. In the season of Advent, the prophets cry, and there's no greater prophet than our Advent prophet than John the Baptist, who preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In this Advent uh, for the next three Sundays, I'm going to take as my sermon text the Old Testament readings for the day, which are all from the prophet Isaiah. And I hope this will help us to prepare us for the coming celebration of the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, the first time, and also to help us prepare for his return at the second coming. Using Isaiah 64, 1 to 9, I want to speak to you today on the theme of the cry of God's people. Next Sunday, I want to speak to you from Isaiah 40, 1 to 11, on the theme of comfort for God's people. And on the third Sunday of Advent, on the basis of Isaiah 64, 1 to 4 and 8 to 11, I want to speak to you on the theme of the covenant with God's people. So for to today, to Isaiah 64, 1 to 9. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. And when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sins. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. O look upon us, we pray, for we are all your people. The official celebration of Christmas begins in the church on December the 25th, going all the way through to the 5th of January. Now, this season of Christmas is often called the 12 days of Christmas, but society has really got the jump on the church as far as the celebration of Christmas is concerned. Stores have been celebrating Christmas virtually since the beginning of November. Whenever you go shopping, the carols are playing, Christmas songs are playing in the background, and the Christmas trees decorate the stores with the tinsel and so on. The city streets are gradually lighting up each weekend as more and more families are putting their festive lights out the front of their houses and making their homes look nice and light and bright. With Christmas, society has the jump on the church in the celebration of Christmas. But when it comes to New Year, 
the church has the jump on society because today is actually the first Sunday of Advent, therefore the first Sunday of the church New Year. Today is New Year's Day for the church. The celebration of New Year won't be thought about by many in society until after Christmas is well over and the hangovers of Christmas have worn off. That's pretty good for us as church because if you read social media, particularly Facebook, the thing that many people are looking forward to is the year 2021. This last year, tainted by the, by the deadly and isolationist effects of coronavirus, has probably been the hardest year in human history since the end of World War II. People have found it very difficult. There are many funny posts on Facebook describing 2020. One I recently read says that if 2020 was a drink, what would it be? The answer is colonoscopy preparation. <laughs> From what you see posted on Facebook, it almost looks as if people are thinking that on the 1st of January 2021, a magic switch is going to flick and all will be well again. And even though things are promising concerning a vaccination for coronavirus, I'm sure we will start the new year still with it and all the difficulties and restrictions that has been involved still in force. We hope it will be, all be gone and the things will be like they were before, but they probably won't. The truth of the matter is it will still be social distancing and sanitising, higher unemployment and lower economy will still be a reality and people will be under a certain amount of stress because of coronavirus and its effects. I heard recently on the ABC radio that in the world of psychology now, this social stress of coronavirus is actually being called corona fatigue as people are tired of the social isolation, the rules and regulations governing life that coronavirus has introduced. Like me, I'm sure you're just all hanging out for the end, to be able to sit side by side in church again, to be able to pass the peace with a hug, and for everybody to be able to receive the common cup in communion. We wish things could go back to the way they were. And historically, this is where we find our text this morning in Isaiah, a cry to go back to the way things were. Historically, our text comes from a time in Israel's history when they had just been in Babylon for 70 years in exile as a judgment and a punishment upon them by God because of their apostasy, their sins against him. But now after 70 years, they were released and they were free to go home. The whole time they had been in Babylon, they dreamed about going home, about things getting back to normal. They imagined their houses and their fields back in Israel. They prayed about returning to the temple to worship. They dreamed about returning to life as they remembered it. But when they did come home, they found that their dreams collided with stark reality and the difference between them was heartbreaking. They found their city in a shambles. They found their homes raised to the ground. They found their fields overgrown and neglected. They found their temple, the place where the very presence of God was supposed to dwell among them, a ruin. They were devastated. Something was wrong. Something was very wrong. And you know, even when they rebuilt their city, their homes, their temple, their farms and fields, it just wasn't the same as before. Even though they hoped for the better, it did not eventuate. And that is where we too find ourselves, not only with coronavirus, 
For even when we do get a vaccine, things won't automatically pop back to the way it was before. And it's the same with many other aspects of our lives. The illness that we've been struggling with now, maybe physical or mental, will probably still be with us in 2021. And even though we might improve or be cured, it will still leave a mark on us and we won't quite be able to go back to the same as things were before. We may have gone through a relationship breakdown in 2020. And by the time you get to the end of 2021, you may have resolved the fallout somewhat, but you won't go back to things being the same as they were before. And this kind of pattern can happen in many areas and aspects of life, even in the church. Now, coronavirus has put most churches into neutral. Plans for ministry development and mission initiatives have been put on hold for many churches in 2020. They've been replaced with industrial plans and health and safety. During the time of lockdown, some people have disconnected from the church. Others have had their health decline during this time and are no longer as vibrant in their health as they were before COVID came and we had the lockdown. Finances became a struggle for some churches and to get enough volunteers to run the basic programs of the church became a problem. As the regulations ease though and things gradually get back to some semblance of normalcy, things are improving, but they will never go back to the way things were before coronavirus. Why is life like this? And why is it not only like this now, but has been so all through human history? Well, it's because there is something wrong, something inherently wrong. As Isaiah says, we all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind, our sins sweep away, sweep us away. You see, by nature, we are all sinners. The prophet says, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are as filthy rags. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, the tire blew out. When a front driver's side tire blows out at speed, the car usually bites into the road and flips around and does a 180. If the car continues to keep going forward in the opposite way, it goes forward not in a straight line, but all over the place. This is a, this is the result of what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. Instead of driving to God, the car spun around and went in its own uncontrollable direction. All of the children of Adam and Eve inherited this lifestyle, going away from God under their own misguided control, blown out by sin. The church calls this original sin. All of us are tainted by sin. All of creation is tainted by sin. Something is wrong, inherently wrong. And there is nothing we can do to turn ourselves around. There is nothing we can do to save ourselves from the situation we are in. Things will never go back to being normal again. As it is in its current existence, the world will never go back to as it was before in the Garden of Eden and the fall of humanity into sin. Things will always be broken. The tires of life will continue to blow out, sending us out of control. And some of those things will be the result of what we do and others will be the result of what others do. Isaiah weeps and wails and wallows in the uncomfortable truth of Israel's responsibility for the mess that it is in. He acknowledges not only the gap between the people of God and God, 
but also the gap that exists between who they are as creatures and who God is as creator. And given that chasm, Isaiah gives voice to our yearning for the presence of a helper, our saviour, someone to rescue us, someone who will come down with unmistakable power and force and deliver us, rending the heavens, splitting them open, coming down in power and glory, making the mountains tremble and the nations to quake, coming to make everything that was broken right again in power. But after begging for this display of God's power and its awesomeness, and after his lament over the wretchedness of humanity and the gap between creatures and the creator, between God and his people, Isaiah makes a turn from something big and scary and apocalyptic to something personal, close and intimate. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. The image of God as potter and God's people as clay breaks this passage open before us. No longer are we talking about a creator who is separate from his creation. No longer are we talking about a God who is tearing the heavens open and coming down violently. We are now talking about a personal, close, intimate relationship where God is the potter and we are the clay. And if God is the potter and we are the clay, he's touching us. We are in his warm embrace as a potter fashions the clay. He's not up here and we down here. He's not up there and we are down here. God is actually in contact with us. He has his hands on us. And if God is the potter, then he wants to shape us. He wants to use all those different areas of aspects of our lives, marriage, family, upbringings, education, work, relationships, choices, environment, health, and so on, to make and shape us into what he wants us to be. If he who is our father is the potter, we can trust him to make something useful, something beautiful from us. And it's not entirely up to us to determine what that exactly is. We come out as he wants us to come out, not as we want us to be. If God is the potter, then from time to time, he has to deal with broken pieces of pottery. And you know those things that cause us to crack. Coronavirus and restriction relationship breakdown, unemployment, ill health, financial loss, depression, grief, disappointment. All of these things are not a problem for the potter. No vessel is beyond rescue. Once the pottery is broken, it can be mixed with new clay until it is soft and it can be molded once more. If God is the potter and we are the clay, there is nothing beyond God's skill to create with us. Now, owing to the damage suffered in the breakage, nothing can go back to the way it was before as things will always be different. But the good news is that the new can be even better than the old. Sinners cry out to God. In our text, the people of Israel cry out to God. As church, we cry out to God. And the good news of Advent is that God did rend the heavens asunder and did come down in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. As Isaiah says, do not remember our sins forever. I look upon us, we pray, for we are all your people. In sending Jesus 
God did not remember our sins and our brokenness forever. He did look upon us with favour because we are his people, his chosen ones. In Jesus, God came down as the master potter to take all that is broken in the world and in us and through his life, death and resurrection, take it in his hands and mould it and shape it into something beautiful and something good. And this work will not be completed until his second coming. But until then, as Isaiah says, since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. So in this Advent season, let us continue to trust in him and wait upon him as he moulds, makes and shapes this world into what he wants it to be at the new creation and us into the people he wants us to be as people who wait on him, who reach out to him, who cry out to him, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Amen. Instead of finishing with a prayer, we're going to finish today with a chorus. It's a little chorus I'm sure you all know and will join in with me. Something beautiful, something good, all my confusion he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful out of my life. Again, something beautiful, something good. All my confusion he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful out of my life. Amen. Amen. Okay, let us stand now for the affirmation of faith. Let us now affirm the faith of the church. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in God, the Son? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as Kate leads us in the prayers for today. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you are our living hope. Lord, we just thank you that you've known us longer than what we've known you. Lord, you formed us, you created us, you've made us, you've set us a path. As your word says, you know the thoughts, the plans that you have for us, ones to prosper, ones to be filled with peace. Lord, we just so thank you. You are just so good. And Lord, as Steve's just spoken of this year and, and the difficulties that people have had through it and the unpredictability. And let you, Lord, are our rock. You never fail. You are a sure footing, steadfast in all your ways. And Lord, we just want to come and we just want to give you praise. And Lord, as we prepare again for as we go forth in this Christmas season, this time of Advent, Lord, we really just want to surrender to you. 
For you are the only thing that is steadfast yesterday, today, tomorrow. And we're excited, Lord. We don't want to go back to the old ways. As Isaiah spoke there of the, the Israelites, we don't want to go back to the old ways. We want to go forward in the things that you've got. So, Lord, we would just pray over this time that you would pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit on your people, Lord. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear all that you have, where you're leading us, what you're doing. That, Lord, as I reflect and think of the shepherds, they sat on that hill and they were blown away as your angels just filled that space. Your glory, Lord. Lord, that's what we're crying out for, your glory. We just bless you. We thank you. We love you. So, Jesus, we thank you again, and we just thank you for the prayer that you gave your disciples that we can proclaim your kingdom come. So let us pray together. Our Father, right in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so we farewell our online viewers with the words of the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And they, you can still join us online for our final song, The Stand. Let's indeed stand and sing together as we prepare for Holy Communion.